So I don't know about you and uh, how you read your Bibles, um, but recently I love to read whole letters, whole books of uh, the Bible. And it's easy, of course, to uh, read and to study small letters, small books, because like the Gospel of Marks take two and a half hours to read through, and sometimes you don't have that time. So I was thinking about uh, when it was my time to share something here, to read through the letter to Titus and to Philemon. And today I'm, I'm going to focus on Paul's letter to Titus. And Paul's letter to Titus, you can pick, if you have your Bibles with you, you can keep your fingers in Titus. And uh, I will have the so-called bird view of this letter. The letter to uh, Titus is one of Paul's last letter ever written, written around the same time as he sends the letters to Timothy. He wrote to Titus when he was on the Greek island of Crete. The letter was written in a very special pattern. The first section on leadership is based on false leaders' deception. The next two sections on right conduct are based on God's grace, mercy, and its provisions. Titus, he was a Greek non-Jewish convert to Christianity. Most likely, Titus, just like Timothy, came to faith under Paul's teaching. Titus had traveled with Paul, and Paul, he trusted Titus. Perhaps Paul chose Titus to be the one to reach Crete because he was once a Greek Gentile and would better understand what was going on in that culture of the day. Titus is mentioned 13 times in the New Testament, in 2 Corinthians, Galatians, and Timothy. When you, uh, we've been studying uh, the book of Acts for almost two years. Michael has been guiding us through that verse by verse. So if you remember in Acts 2 and 11, it says that both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, and we all hear these people speaking in our own language about the wonderful things God has done. So there, the Cretans are mentioned. Some may have taken their faith back to the island of Crete, but Paul mentions in Titus 1.5 that Paul was leaving Titus on the island to complete the work he had started there. The only other time Crete is mentioned in the New Testament is in the book of Acts, in Acts 27, when Paul was being transported to Rome by a ship to face a trial. The old Cretan mythology was influencing the new started church. Paul began the church in Crete without appointing leaders. This was generally what happened as he planted churches all around. In Crete, Paul gave Titus the responsibility to appoint the leaders and Paul outlined what leadership is needed to look like. Both Ephesus and Crete faced similar problems with false teachers. However, the church in Ephesus was older while the church in Crete was brand new. Crete was also socially less civilized than Ephesus. Galatians 2 mentioned that Titus went with Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem, where they went to the council at Jerusalem to debate whether Christians had to be circumcised or not. Since Titus was an uncircumcised Gentile, his presence as Paul's disciple ended this discussion. Ultimately, the council determined that Christians did not need to be circumcised, but laid out some basic moral rules that Christians had to follow. We know rather little about either these two young preachers, Timothy and Titus. Titus, however, seems to have been a stronger man, both physically and spiritually. Paul expresses less concern for Titus' welfare than he did for Timothy's. Titus probably were more matured, and he possesses a, perhaps a viral personality. But Titus was Paul's child. He refers to him as my son. Paul 
was his spiritual father. Crete Island. I don't know if you've been to this Crete Island. Someone been there? Well, if you haven't, there are some facts. It was here at Crete Island where Paul was shipwrecked. And we can read about that in the book of Acts. He was shipwrecked on the south side of Crete Island at a place named Fairhaven. And we, as a family, has been to Crete several times. And on one occasion, we went to this place where Paul was shipwrecked. One might think that there should be like a statue or a plaque or something to remember what Paul was doing there, but no. The only thing we saw was a hippie campsite. Crete Island is the biggest island in Greece, a very nice place, I can really recommend it. It's a great island, a place for old people, for young people, for young families, great beaches, lots of things to see and to do, and of course, good food. Crete served the center of the Minoan civilization about 2700 to 1420 BC, which many regards as the earliest recorded civilization in the continent of Europe. On the eastern side of the island of Crete is the Minoan temple of Knossos, a very famous place to visit and absolutely worth a visit, even though they excavated and restored the place with methods that we will not do today. There is a lot of cement and other things, but uh, it's a quite interesting place. The Church of St. Titus at Cortis is one of the most imposing monuments of Byzantine architecture. The church was built in the mid sixth to early 7th century AD. We do not know to which saint it was dedicated. And nearby is a larger church of St. Titus, the large five ailed basilica of Cortis. This was the seat of the metropolitan seat of Cortis. But it was destroyed by an earthquake in 670 AD and then abandoned. There are many other churches on Crete dedicated to Titus, one rather big in the city of Heraclion, and this used to be a mosque. The Arabs came here and conquered the island and built many mosques, but if not demolished, they have been changed into churches. Crete has been under Roman rule, Byzantine first period, Arab rule, Byzantine second period, Venetian rule, and you can see that many fantastic structures from this time, like in the harbor of Khania. And then it has also been under the Ottoman rule. After the Ottoman rule, there came a Crete independent period. And after this period, World War II then came and the Germans settled here. The Battle of Crete is a very interesting battle during the Second World War, but sad to say, young Germans and allied lives were spilled. And you can, if you can't read this, the age is 22 and something like that. And it's, it's very, very sad. But then Crete in Paul's day. Cretans who apparently had a reputation of lacking ethical principles, they were stealing and harboring robbers and pirates. William D. Mounds, he writes this in his biblical commentary. He said that they, and he quotes in Titus 1 and 2, that Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons, and that is not a flattering image, I have to say. A Greek historian by the name of Polyobius lived in the second century BC, made the following comments about Cretans. 
not very flattering, I have to say. He wrote that money is so highly valued among them that its possession is not only thought to be necessary, but in the highest degree creditable. And in fact, greed and so on are so native to the soil in Crete that they are the only people in the world among whom no stigma attached to any sort of gain whatsoever. Cretans, by their ingrained areas, are engaged in countless public and private seductions, murders, and civil war. So, Cretans, not a very nice people, they say. And here they started a church. Titus is a rather short letter, just three chapters. And the short version is that in chapter one, Paul says that the church is to be an orderly organization. And we see this in Titus one and five. In chapter two, he emphasizes that the church is to teach and preach the word of God, but to speak the things which become sound doctrine. He said that the church must be the doctrinally sound of the faith. And then in the last chapter, in chapter three, we see that the church is to perform good works, but to put them in mind to be subject to principles and powers, to obey the magistrates and to be ready to do every good work. In other words, the church is saved by grace, is to live by grace, and is to demonstrate her fate to the world by her good works. But if we uh, look a little bit closer to uh, Titus 1, verse 5 to 9, it provides a list of elder qualification which Titus was to use in selecting or appointing church leaders. This list, along with 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 7, includes the qualification which have been used to select elders and pastors, church leaders since the New Testament times. They include character, family leadership, and teaching abilities. This last trait includes an ability to rebuke those who contradict sound doctrine. So it reads, this is why I left you in Crete. You are to set straight all the remaining matters and appoint elders from every town as I charge you to do. Elders must be blameless, the husbands of only one wife. Their children must be believers and must be not be open to the accusation of loose living or being rebellious. This is because an overseer, as one of God's household manager, must be blameless. He must not be a stubborn or hot-headed or a heavy drinker or a bully or an eager for shameful gain. He must be hospitable, a lover of goodness, sensible, just, holy and self-control. He must hold firmly to the rebel word which goes with the teaching so that he may have the power both to exhort people with healthy instruction and to give a proper rebuttal to those who oppose it. Amen. So when reading through this list, I am an elder of this church, one of rather many, and we are a nice group of people. We are a great mix of uh, sexes, of age, and perhaps not culture so much. But we are, in a way, not always thinking the same, which is a good thing. It's a healthy thing. But I'm not sure that I and the others were appointed by this list we find in Titus. Verses 10 and 16 speaks about false teachers in Crete. These men taught that circumcision was required for Christians, upsetting entire families in this process. Paul commands Titus to rebuke them sharply with the goal that they would be sound and accurate in their faith. On Crete, there were churches, but no elders, no structured leadership, so a huge need to appoint good and qualified leaders. 
there was. Titus needed a so-called manual to find these leaders. Paul had a huge concern for the membership here as well. False teaching was surely coming in, but here in Crete, the biggest problem was strange ideas circulated around with the members. The churches needed a strong leader to handle the situation. One theologian says that good leadership, good teaching makes the members, and in this case, the congregation, less dependent on the leader, contrary to bad leadership. And that is the same thing with parenting. To get a hold of the problem here was to have quality in the leadership and quality also in the membership. So to fix this problem, the leaders needed to confront the people troubling the situation. It is still necessary today to confront when strange ideas and problems happens. But many leaders are afraid to confront and sad to say that's especially true in churches. I'm not sure why, perhaps you have the answer. But one thing can we be that we have the wrong idea by the word of love. We need love, we need love and we need to love all people and if we get that wrong, an action totally wrong. So in the way of trying to love, we tend to accept everything. As a leader, you must face the problems and we deal with them. Otherwise, they will grow bigger and harder to handle. We all, not just leaders, need to speak the truth, the truth of the gospel. In Titus 2, 1 to 10, 10 gives specific instructions for various groups within the church. Titus is commanded to teach each of these groups with authority. Paul includes directions tailored for older men and older women, younger men and younger women. This part of the chapter emphasizes characteristics such as self-control, faithfulness, dignity, respect, godliness, and love. Older men and women are to be mentor younger men and women, respectively, of course. Paul also gives direction to servants regarding submission to their masters. Titus is giving instruction as well for the correct conduct of a leader. A major reason for right behavior is to leave critics no room to attack the Christian faith. In Titus chapter 2 also explain how the grace of God inspires Christians toward the right behaviors and right thinking. The qualities which Paul describes early in the chapter must be grounded in the grace God gives to us. The previous scriptures gave instructions for proper behavior of church members. Paul also commands teachers, Titus to teach these ideas boldly and with authority. These behaviors and thinking are nothing we check and try to control nowadays in the churches, not in this church anyway. Paul, he gave Titus three specific commands when communicating the word of truth to others. First, he was to speak the truth, to know the truth, to be secure in the faith and sound in doctrine. Very often, pastors and preachers are teaching the word that the congregation wants to hear, not what the congregation needs to hear. I know. It might be hard to stick out your head, but it's needed sometimes. Paul's second command to Titus was to exhort the body of Christ. To exhort means to give a warning. And we read about warning, we heard about warnings last Sunday when Michael was teaching. To give us this advice. To exhort someone can rage from comforting a hurt soul. 
to providing encouragement, but it can also refer to being honest to a fellow brother or sister in Christ and speaking the truth, but in love. Paul's final instruction to Titus was, let no one disregard you. It seems apparent that certain people had challenged the authority of Titus. Titus was, was clearly called into his leadership position in Crete. And Paul wanted to be sure that he was not intimidated by those in his care. And that his presentation of the gospel was not discarded or dismissed. In Titus 3, the last section, Paul encouraged Christians to live separately from the immoral culture of Crete. Paul he explains that salvation is entirely on the basis of God's mercy. It is not something we earn by doing good works. When a person accepts Christ, they experience a spiritual cleansing or a regeneration. The Holy Spirit is given to us as a result of God's generosity and of grace. The text affirms that this depiction of grace is something to be trusted. Titus is giving instruction to emphasize these basic principles, to insist on them as well. Paul also lists four activities which Titus is told to avoid. And the thing to avoid is something that I do not avoid myself. I don't know about you, but um, one, the, the things are pointless debates, arguments over genealogy, quarrels and debates over the law of Moses. I end up in pointless debate in my office, I can say. I don't know about you, but I have to learn from Paul here. These things that I just mentioned not only waste time, they give inappropriate attention to false teachers. Instead, those who teach false doctrine are to be warned and then to be cut off. So what can we learn from Titus today? Paul's words can teach us some very important lessons. The first is how those who are in leadership positions within the church should behave. We learn how to choose our leaders and what God is charging them to accomplish. Paul emphasizes sound doctrine because of the false teaching that was happening. The same false teaching are heard around the world today, and as leaders in the church, we are to commit to the spreading of the truth. The second lesson we learn has to do with our salvation. Paul is teaching us that the gift of salvation should not end with us. It should be shared with the world around us, as it was meant to give us a beautiful life. In Titus 3 and 14, Paul says, let our people learn to devote themselves to good works for pressing needs so that they will not be unfruitful. Our good works will show our love and our devotion to Christ. It will help us to show what the gift of salvation has done for us and what it can do for others. Our world today is full of needs. There are the homeless, the unborn, the widows, and so many others. People that need the love of Christ in their hearts will not only receive it as we work to help them. We are not to be judgmental, but compassionate. Christ commands us to go to the ends of the world to share the good news. The words of Paul reminds us that we are to remember what Christ did for us. 
We are freed so that we may aid in the freeing of all mankind. We are not to sit still and keep the message of Jesus Christ only to ourselves. I don't know in your culture, but in my culture, if you are, for instance, in a meeting, if, and if you say, well, I believe, some may say that, well, in this meeting or in this company, we don't believe, we choose fact, believe you have to do in the church. Have you heard about this? We believe not only in the church, we believe everywhere, even in that meeting. So remember, working to help others in need and sharing the gift of salvation is as important today as it was when Paul wrote these words. Many churches today focus more on the form of worship, the music styles, lightning and building designs than they do on the content of the faith. They mean to proclaim. The final lesson I want to share with you comes not from the letter, but it's from an episode in the lives when famine struck Jerusalem. Paul sent Titus to Corinth with a letter, the second letter to the Corinthians, which contain an impassioned plea for generous support of the poor in Jerusalem, using phrases like, he who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. God loves a cheerful giver, and he who supplies seeds to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your resources and increase the harvest of your righteousness. This is something we can keep in mind as a community of believers, to each other and also while offering. So the conclusion of this rather short time in Titus. Titus were to set to fix uh, certain things. Teaching sound doctrine. And the question is, how do we today make sure of this? Helping um, believers mature spiritually. Equipping them to live for Jesus Christ despite opposition. And Titus as a leader, Titus was anticipated the problems in Corinth and in a way prevented a split in Crete. Titus was always honest to both Paul and to the churches that he led. Titus knew how to deal with the problems in Crete and it dealt with one problem at the time. Sad to say today, we try to fix a multitude of problems at the same time, and it's wearing people down, and we won't get the result that we want. Titus saw the details, but he also saw the big picture. Titus, he never gave up. He addressed problems within and around the church, but fought to the end. To solve them. I also heard from a pastor once that when you want to look for Paul, people direct you to the religious section in the bookstore or the library. But in a way, that's not the whole picture of Paul. Paul was much more than this. He was much more than a religious figure. In those days, you would find him in leadership, in politics, in the religious section as well. He was all over the place. Paul also developed new leaders, Timothy, Philemon, Silence, just as to mention same, some. But that is a theme that we see all over in the Bible. We see Moses and Joshua. Elijah and Elisha, Barnabas and Saul, and of course, Jesus and the 12 disciples. So Titus 
is a good letter to read through to study what it says not only on leadership but also on membership and remember leaders are not the only one in a position in a company or in a church because leadership is about influence and we all influence others so in a way we are all leaders and we are all to take this to our heart so please please let us pray father author and inspirer of all things hear our prayers send your spirit that we may humbly be guided by your will touch our hearts with true generosity to raise up a house of god for the inspiration and renewal of all your faithful servants help us to speak the truth even when it's hard to do so help us to be bold when it comes to you we ask all these things in the name of jesus amen thank you